the light, and it says, verse 1, and it says, uh, Now they cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditors come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, and what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. So the aspect of the application is that, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to gather and I want you to get as many as you can of these vessels. So when he says gather not a few, that means you're going to go and you're going to borrow. You're going to, you're going to search into the closet, you're, everything, because you're going to get as many vessels as possible. And then, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shall pour out all into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her, and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. It came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. And so the promise was that you get all the vessels that you can. I have some oil. Start pouring the oil in the vessels. And as long as you have vessels, keep pouring. And when the son says, Mom, there's no more. We can't get any more. And all of a sudden, once that last vessel is full, it stopped. It stopped uh, being multiplied. And this is what then, then she came and told the son, the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou with thy children of the rest. So we're talking about preparation. Our preparation precedes God's blessings. And so the prophet's wife would never experience the blessing of God or the miracle of God unless she was willing to prepare by having the oil and being willing to use whatever it took to be able to get God in position that we can, he can answer and take care of her. And so the aspect of uh, preparing ourselves is very important. Um, I, I believe last week we talked about as a believer that we can read the Bible, but if our hearts are not ready to receive it, we get nothing out of it. That's why that when you're doing it. Now, when I read my Bible, number one, I don't read my Bible when I'm about ready to fall asleep. Why is that? Because I fall asleep. And but there's times where I can open up the Bible and my mind is so cloudy and I try to read, it's kind of like the fog just gets deeper. And so there's no shame in closing the Bible and so say, you know what? I'm going to get a cup of coffee, give me some air, and maybe this isn't the right time to read it, but I'll make sure I read it because it does no good to read and receive nothing out of it. Now, and the other context of it is that um, you can read it and say, well, the only thing out of it, but we can read it and God can take what we read and apply it to our lives and bring those things to memory. So both ends of it is important, but you'll receive more by preparing yourself instead of waiting, uh, instead of just doing it randomly. And uh, so we look at the, the vessels, no oil, until the vessels were gathered. And then we talked about Naaman, about having to dip seven times in the, in the muddy river. Kind of like, uh, go down to Cow Creek, or go down to the Neosha River. Both of them are nasty places to, to walk into. And can you imagine if someone that was very uh, highfalutin, very important in this area, and they had, they had leprosy, and the prophet said, I want you to go down there, and I, I, I'm not doing that. Those are nasty places. They're disgusting. They're smelly, and there's flies, and there's all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to try to go to where there's a creek where there's, it's cleaner. And thank God for that little, that little maid, the little Israeli maid, who was a captive by the Syrian army. And then all of a sudden, through her, and through the other people say, well, if you would have told you to do this, you have done it, then go do it. What's it going to hurt you if you do that? And once again, complete obedience without adding things. Now, it took, he said you needed it seven times. If you had dipped six times, would he have been healed? No. no. If you had dipped eight times, would he have been healed? No. If he had just dipped himself one long time, would he have been healed? No. Seven times. God, when God is specific about things, 
that is a reason for that. There's no wiggle room when it comes to specificity. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. No Messiah until the way was prepared. Verse 3 says, The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, Prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And so before Jesus Christ came, he had to have someone as a prophet to prepare the people. And we know who that was. It was called John the Baptist. I mean, he was forthright. I mean, you knew exactly what he was talking about. He did not leave anything out of um, questioning about what he had to say. When he looked at all the the, uh, the, prop, the the religious people and called them vipers and uh, repent, I mean, he was very serious about doing that when it came to the aspect about being about being baptized. And so God used John the Baptist to prepare the people to remind them, hey, it's time, Jesus is coming. But then not just the prophet, he prepared the culture. He prepared the, the, the whole atmosphere of the time for Jesus Christ to be born. It was called the Pax Romana. And that was called the Roman Peach. You had the Roman Rose. You had the, the freedom. You had the universal language. You had the universal language. You had the freedom to travel. You had the, the Roman soldiers that protected people. So many different things. Then because of that, have one government controlling everything, that was a perfect time for, for all of a sudden now, Mary and Joseph, you've got to go to Bethlehem. <laughs> and so they had to go to Bethlehem. We know the story, but what happens in Bethlehem is that he is born. Then all of a sudden, while all that is happening, you've got shepherds at the right place at the right time preparing to that the, all of a sudden the angel comes and they come and they're just, Wow. They're able to glorify God. Then you have everyone else that comes. And two years later, then you have the, the Magi that come. And we don't know how many Magi there was. All we know is why do you say there's three Magi? Because of three gifts that we know of. We're not sure exactly what other gifts may have been brought. But the fact is they brought the very best. Now, when you're traveling long distances, I don't know about you. When it, whenever I travel with Lucinda, I mean, we had enough stuff in that van or vehicle we traveled that we could live in that van for two or three weeks. <laughs> she had snacks. She had blankets. She had soap. She had, she had awesome. Well, why are you bringing this? Because just in case. Just in case was, we may break down. We may go to a place where the hotel doesn't have these certain things. And, you know, there, we did so much travel. You know what? She was right on one of those occasions. And then she'd tell me, you know I'm right. Yeah, I'm, I just like arguing with her once in a It's just being prepared is so important. And so it, so it was a random time. No, God and the fullness of the time, the Bible says in the book of Galatians, the time, the right time, Jesus came into this world. The right time. The right time for John the Baptist to come. The right time for all those different things, all the different characters involved in this at the right time, at the right place. Which tells me we serve a God of order and God is in control of everything. What's happening around this world says it, it chaos us, but God is using the chaos to get this world prepared for the, for the Antichrist, which I believe is in the wings right now. The spirit of Antichrist is already here. I think I might have said this to church. I've talked to so many different people about different things. But I, I just really believe that it just seems like this year more than any other year, there's just that spirit of Christmas isn't there with, with society. I just don't sense it. There's so much anger and animosity and depression and frustration around society that people can't get to point of, you know, uh, just being kind. I mean, I used to enjoy just at least for two weeks, people being decent to one another. You used to love watching those, the bell ringers. 
I make sure that when I see them, I thank them. Merry Christmas. Appreciate all that you're doing. And I mean, I've had people, I mean, get very, really rude to those people just because you're ringing a bell. <clears throat> it just seems like society today is changed. There's that spirit of Antichrist where let's just remove everything about Jesus and the whole story about any biblical character. Our society is just doing everything they can to remove any type of thing to, to remove from visual contact uh, about anything that reminds them about Jesus Christ. I was watching on the television day where a private ski lodge in California is being sued by some group because they were wanting to put up a statue of Mary and Jesus. It's a private mountain. It is a private business. If you don't like the private business, guess what? Go somewhere else. You go to California, there's all kinds of ski resorts out there. But And they said, we're, we disagree with the thoughts of what that represents. Who cares? That's my belief. But it's so much antichrist that any type of icon or any anything that represents Jesus Christ and the, the nativity scene, it's being removed. In fact, they had, and I think it was up in Michigan, that literally um, they took the nativity scene off of a, off of a, a, away from a fire station's front yard and replaced it with elves. And why? Because one person said, that offends me. Well, don't go down the street that way. Yeah. Turn your head. That's the spirit of Antichrist. And it's going to get worse. That's why we've got to prepare ourselves. Yes, Jesus is going to come. I'm looking forward to it more every day. Lord, just come on. I'm done. I'm ready. Come get us. But as a believer, I've also got to understand that while I'm living on this earth, that I've got to be prepared for how people are going to respond because of who we represent, Jesus Christ. It, we live, I mean, it's so sad what you see in our society. But so you've got to be prepared. So there was no Messiah without the way of being prepared. Look at Hosea chapter 10. Hosea. Right after the book of Daniel. Verses 12 and 13. Chapter 10 of Hosea. Hosea chapter 10. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, till they come and rain righteousness upon you. You have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity, you have eaten the fruit of lies. Because thou didst not trust in thy way and the multitude of thy mighty men. Now, we have had been in a drought. And uh, one of the places as I drive, uh, I was talking to one of the kids, the teenagers, and I was talking to him about what his wife's family is having to basically break up the ground. He said, because the ground is so dry right now, you've got to break it up to prepare it to be able to plant all the different seeds and stuff like that and put the fertilizer in there. He said, you got to get it in the ground before it dries out. And he said, his, his father was saying that it's been a very long time that it's been, the ground has been that hard. You could drive up, you could drive 18 wheelers on there on, on fields that have been used for years and not even see a dent in the ground. You know that ground is hard. Yeah. And it has been like that, hasn't it? And so he says, break up your fallow ground. So literally you've got to go in there and you've got to till that ground up. And you've got to basically break it up by forcing 
something that is strong enough to break through that ground. You would think, well, the ground, it doesn't take much to break. They said that they had these, these little wheels that the, the discs and like that. Some of those discs in the past have broke because the ground was that hard. Can you imagine steel being broke by dirt? That's sometimes how, how hard the ground is. And when he talks about reaping and sowing, he said, you're only going to reap righteousness and mercy if you break up your fallow ground. Is that there'll be no harvest of righteous fruit in our lives until we have our heart and our life prepared for the seed to be planted and the seed to be watered and for God to provide the, the increase. So we've got to break it up. It's pre preparing. It is getting ourselves ready for God to move. Now, I, I, I have um, people that are praying. I, I'd like to see revival when Jesus Christ comes back. A lot of Christians didn't get revived. They are cold and disheartened. They're, they're just basically just going through the motions. And it'd be great to see people returning back to the place of God and return to the service of God, just a place where they recognize it's all about God, well, the, way it used to, the way they used to. I pray for that. And so how do you do that? You pray. And then you may have to fast. Whatever it is, you may have to talk to them. Whatever it is, but you've got to prepare it. Revival doesn't come just helter-skelter. Revival comes when people prepare themselves. They prepare themselves. And so, um, as believers, this aspect of faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The reason why many people, their faith is not strong because they're not prepared, not by, not by listening, but also understanding and applying what they know. You know, when you look at a high schooler that's in 12th grade, you would hope and pray that they know more than the ABCs. Yeah. You would think that, that how in the world can you progress into college and the life without knowing your one, two, threes or ABCs? In the Christian realm, there's an awful lot of people that have made that profession of faith but can't do the very basics of the ABCs, the one, two, threes of Christianity. So why aren't they growing? It's not because of anybody else, but the ground is not prepared to receive it so it can grow. And so there's uh, no oil to the vessels were gathered, uh, no healing until the leper had dipped seven times. There's no Messiah until the way was prepared. There's no harvest until the ground is broken up. Uh, look at John chapter, John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Look at verse 1 through 11 says this. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Notice how judgmental these, these disciples are. The first thing they said was, who sinned? Why is this person blind? It must have been because he did something wrong. Jesus answered, neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So God had already prepared this man that was blind to be at this place that he could use this situation to bless and encourage and strengthen other people. And he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. We are getting closer and closer to the night time of, of life. Is that as the sun begins to set to in this in this uh, dispensation of time, is that as the sun begins to set, is that uh, we can only work until the, the sun falls and Jesus Christ comes to get us. You ever try to do a project outside the dark? Doesn't work. About two weeks ago, I was getting ready to go pick up faith, and it was about ten o'clock at night. And Snoopy, I normally take him with me, and, and he took off around the side of the house, and then I heard him barking or yipping. I thought, why are you yipping? That's dark to that side. I thought, what is going on? Well, I pulled out my phone, and it was a possum. <laughs> and it was playing possum. <laughs> and I said, Snoopy, get over here. And he's circling that stupid thing and yipping at it. And the thing is, I'm not doing anything. 
And finally, Snoopy was, uh, got bored with it, got in the car, and as soon as, as, soon as Snoopy got away from it, that possum let him just walk away. <laughs> I would never have saw that. I'd have thought Snoopy was going crazy until I had some light. And so he says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm in my world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind men with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is this not the, that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Can you imagine being doubted and question who you are? Therefore said they unto him, How are thine that eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received some. How did you get to be able to see? I did exactly what Jesus told me to do. I didn't question him. I just did. He took spit, he went to the ground, he made clay, and he put it on my eyes. He told me to go to the pool, and I got to the pool slow on, and I washed like he told me to, and all of a sudden, I can see. That's all I know. There had not been any miracle if the man would have questioned Jesus one day. So absolute trust in someone that maybe never said, saw, but the fact is this is that he was prepared when you're in those type of situations and, and those things are pr provided for you, you're going to do it with the hopes that you can be relieved of that handicap. That's exactly what this man was. So the man would have seen him sight without him having to have clay made out of spit. Now I remember when I was a kid, that was mama's favorite way of cleaning me. It was by hair tonic, I mean, she moved my hair around, and then she spit on her hands, and she wiped my cheeks and my head forehead, and it stunk, and, and just, oh, quit messing, moving around. Mine did. <laughs> no, no, but that was Mama's way of cleaning me. It may have been disgusting, but it worked. But can you imagine it on your eyes? And the sensation of having something that you've never seen before being applied and the fact is of going to a pool and I'm sure he had to be guided we don't know that but he had to be guided because I'm not sure if that pool was right there but all those things worked out and he says you know what I don't know what happened This is all I know is this is what I did and now I can see that's all that matters and that's where faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. His faith was exercised. His faith was, his faith was honored. Because he listened and obeyed. And then he put God in the spot because if God tells us to do it, we do it. And he's obligated to take care of that. And so preparation. And we'll end with that. Is that uh, no vision without obedience. And so uh, being prepared as believers is so important. One, Jesus is coming. Now, I've said this before. If we were told that Jesus Christ is going to come at this particular day, at this particular time, what would you and I change or do to be able to be prepared to say, Jesus, here am I, I'm ready to go. Kind of like waiting for a bus. He is coming. Are we preparing ourselves? Are we continuing to grow while we're waiting for the Lord in eager anticipation and sometimes frustration because, Lord, why, why are you waiting so long? I'm ready. Well, that's wonderful, but there's some things that God has to get in line that this way He is ready. We can be ready if we want to, but unless we're willing to wait for Him to do that, we can do nothing. No, there's not be any deliverance until we work together with Him and let Him work everything out. He's going to come again. So our faith continues to grow if we obey, if we prepare ourselves for God to work. We serve a great big God. And let's just continue to do what we need to do and let's see what God can do. Father, we honor you. We bless you. We want to praise you. Lord, help us tonight. And Lord, we're not sure what this week has to hold for us. We do know that you've you're already been there. You're already in the future. 
And so, Father, may we just wake up, take the steps of faith that you want us to take, be honored and glorified in all that's said and done. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, Brother Bob, once you come, we'll take up this offering. And so, um, I'm excited to see what God, how God's going to work out this prayer picture. The $650, I mean, I believe God has that much money in his account. They have to worry about God's account being poor or uh, over overdrawn. Is this particular one for the church? Itself? This is for the church. This is for the church. I will give us my hand to take Jesus over to If you want that designated, then, then let me know. And then uh, then I'll make sure it gets you 